Chapter 6, Mental Illness and the Problem of Imitation. But besides real diseases, we are subject to many that are only imaginary, for which physicians have invented imaginary cures. These have their several names, and so have the drugs that are proper for them. Jonathan Swift, 1726. One of the most interesting and important characteristics we possess as human beings is our immense talent for imitation. This talent is, of course, not limited to human beings. We learn our mother tongue and much else besides by such a process. The ability to imitate is an inherent and inherited part of our basic behavioral repertoire. As such, it is neither good nor bad. Our vast vocabulary for describing different kinds of imitations, for example, aping, duplicating, copying, counterfeiting, faking, feigning, impersonating, malingering, mimicking, pretending, repeating, simulating, is eloquent testimony that like almost anything we do, imitating may serve many aims and be deemed either good or bad depending on the observer's interests and values. Imitating illness may thus be a problem for one person, the physician, and a solution for another, the would-be patient. We must keep in mind, too, that every item in the repertoire of the doctor-patient relationship can be imitated. In short, we should be as sensitive to the differences between real doctors and false doctors, or real treatments and false treatments, as we are to the differences between real diseases and factitious diseases, or real patients and malingerers. To imitate something, a pattern of sounds, called language, a masterpiece or text, called a copy, a precious gem called paste, we must have an original or a model of it. Obviously, if there is no original or real X, there can be no imitation or copy of X. If there is no truth, there can be no lie. This is one of the reasons why I took care to clarify at the outset what we mean by the term illness and to offer an original model of it. Since the idea of illness comprises undesirable anatomical and physiological processes, as well as certain characteristic behaviors we exhibit when we are ill, it is possible to imitate both illness and the behavior of ill persons. In fact, nothing is easier. I'm not sure what children learn first, to speak or to malinger. After all, what could be easier than to pretend that we hurt even if we do not? What should we make of the fact that healthy persons often pretend to be ill? How should we interpret the phenomenon that used to be called malingering, but which psychiatrists now call factitious illness? Before trying to answer these questions, let me diagnose and dispose of a troublesome problem concerning the contemporary medical posture toward malingering. Malingering reconsidered. The idea of malingering or pretending to be ill presupposes an idea of illness. Obviously, a person cannot copy or counterfeit an act or an object without being familiar with it, whether it be money, a famous painting, being ill, or curing illness. To put it the simplest possible way, lying presupposes knowing the truth, or what one thinks is the truth. The person ignorant of the truth uttering a falsehood is said to be erring, not lying. These are important considerations in relation to the problem of imitating illness or mental illness, because if we do not know what illness is or do not want to attach a clear meaning to the term, then we shall be unable to distinguish real illness from counterfeit illness. Indeed, this is why, as I shall show in a moment, physicians were much clearer about malingering at the beginning of modern medicine, when the business of diagnosing and treating disease was a nascent craft, than they are today, when medicine is a triumphant ideology. In the not-so-good nor so old days of medicine, doctors could do little to cure disease, but were confident that there was a distinction, however difficult it might be to make sometimes, between persons who were truly sick and those who were not but pretended to be, whom they called malingerers. Of course, those days are gone. I look back on them not in nostalgia, but in the expectation they can teach us something. What they can teach us is this. Insofar as we define disease as a condition of the body, and insofar as we infer its existence from the sick person's behavior, it must be possible to imitate being sick. Everyone knows that. How then can we be sure whether a person who complains of pain speaks the truth? Whether he really experiences pain or only pretends to feel pain? Whether he feels a negligible discomfort and exaggerates it into an unbearable suffering? Worse still, how can we be sure whether such a complaint signifies only an unpleasant personal experience 
of no particular medical import, or the presence of an underlying disease requiring prompt treatment, such as an acutely inflamed appendix. How can we ever be sure whether a complaint is only a complaint or a symptom of an underlying disease? Obviously, there can be no certainty in such matters. But that does not mean that imitating illness does not exist or that it is particularly difficult to distinguish a person who is ill from one who is not. The imitation of illness, however, poses a serious problem, and not only for physicians, but also for parents, teachers, businessmen, judges, all of us. Perhaps the most important problem is that we must take a definite initial stand on the distinction between real and fake diseases and real and fake patients. Moreover, we have only two options. One option, which is old, is to distinguish between persons who are truly ill and those who are not, between honest patients and dishonest malingerers, and to accept the former but not the latter as persons deserving medical care and the benefits of the sick role. The dangers that lie that way are familiar, and I shall not belabor them. The other option, popular today, is to downplay the distinction between persons with demonstrable bodily diseases and those without them. It is impossible to ignore this distinction completely, to define both types of complainants as ill, and to accept both types of persons as deserving of medical care and the benefits of the sick role. The danger in this case is that we legitimize both of these types of persons as bona fide patients suffering from bona fide diseases, eliminating the distinction between truly ill persons and malingerers while creating certain novel distinctions, namely between persons suffering from bodily illnesses, mental illnesses, and factitious illness. The consequences of this choice are, in my opinion, even more disastrous, especially for our political freedoms and public safety, than are the consequences of the first choice. Moreover, this choice entails the embarrassing logical absurdity of defining and treating both real diseases and fake diseases as real diseases. Is a malingered, faked, imitated, factitious illness a condition, an illness or mental illness we deliberately or otherwise cause ourselves to have? Or is it an act of deliberately or otherwise assuming the role of patient or mental patient? not because we are ill, but because we want to be patients. The relationship between having an illness, diabetes, and faking illness, a non-diabetic person injecting himself with insulin, or between being a patient brought to the emergency room with a skull fracture and impersonating the patient role, presenting oneself in the emergency room with complaints of renal colic and offering a specimen of urine with blood in it drawn from our own finger, is of the same type as the relationship between an original and its imitation, real money and counterfeit. Asserting that real illness and factitious illness are both real illnesses is like saying that a Picasso and its copy are both Picassos. The present medical and psychiatric posture toward the conditions called factitious illnesses embodies precisely this absurdity. Malingering, explains Kurt Eisler, a prominent Viennese-American psychoanalyst and the director of the ill-famed Freud archives, is always the sign of a disease, often more severe than a neurotic disorder. The diagnosis should never be made but by the psychiatrist. After reviewing the recent psychiatric literature on simulating insanity, George G. Hay, a British psychiatrist, similarly concludes that usually the simulation of schizophrenia is simply the prodromal, phase of genuine illness. The majority of such patients will be suffering from the early stages of a genuine psychosis and should be managed accordingly. Evidently, Hay sees no self-contradiction in the proposition that the imitation of schizophrenia is itself genuine schizophrenia. This situation illustrates what the epistemologist of psychiatry is up against. How did we get to this point in the history of psychiatry and in the cultural history of the West where illness and counterfeit illness are both accepted and viewed as illnesses of the same kind, or as identical, or where counterfeit illness is viewed as even more serious an illness than the illness it counterfeits. I shall try to show how we got here by scrutinizing both the patient's pretending of being ill and the doctor's pretending of curing. Pretending to be ill. For the reasons I have just mentioned, it should not surprise us that at the dawn of modern medicine, when professionals and educated laymen alike began to realize that diseases, such as smallpox or dropsy, 
are dysfunctions of the body, the distinction between sickness and malingering was much clearer than it is today. The following example illustrates this point. In the 16th century, there were frequent episodes of maniacal dancing typically occurring in public. These frenzies, spreading from group to group and city to city like the plague and called dance epidemics or St. Vitus's dance, were thought to be due to a contagion such as caused epidemics of infectious diseases. Paracelsus, 1493-1541, considered to be one of the first modern physicians, disagreed. He attributed St. Vitus's dance to the irrational power of imagination and belief, surely a remarkably perceptive way of describing it, and asserted that it is nothing but an imaginative sickness arising frequently in women from a voluptuous urge to dance. Today, psychiatrists call such phenomena mass hysteria, or the results of brainwashing, or, most pretentiously of all, factitious illness, and the editors of the New York Times and Science recognize these pathetic psychiatric imitations of medical diagnoses as the names of bona fide diseases. Moliere on malingering, the most marvelously lucid and prescient presentation of imitating both illness and curing, the two typically going hand in hand, is, I suspect, Moliere's A Doctor in Spite of Himself, written in 1666. This comedy lays bare, in the simplest and most direct way possible, what modern psychiatrists and psychoanalysts pretentiously call the psychodynamics of conversion hysteria. Actually, Moliere shows us something far more important, namely, that what we now call mental illness is a false problem of our modern scientific age, of an age in which we see complicated problems where what stares us in the face are obvious solutions. In short, what seems to us a mysterious mental-physical malady, Moliere understood as well, I shall let him speak for himself. The scenes I want to present begin with Sganarelle, a woodcutter impersonating a physician, being called upon to treat Lucinde, a young girl who has lost her voice. Even before Sganarell sees his patient, Moliere, through the mouth of Jacqueline, a friend of Lucin's father, Geronte, tells us what Charcot and Freud supposedly discovered more than 200 years later. The best doctor you could give your daughter, to my way of thinking, would be a strapping young man for a husband, one as she had a fancy for. What was an ordinary and obvious fact to Moliere and his audience in the 17th century thus became, in the 19th century, a mysterious malady called hysteria, while its solution became, in our own day, a marvelous medical remedy called sex therapy. How right and prophetic Moliere was when he remarked that, once you have the cap and gown of the doctor, all you need do is open your mouth. Whatever nonsense you talk becomes wisdom and all the rubbish good sense. But let us return to Scannerell. He arrives at Geronte's house and Lucinda is brought in to meet him. He asks her, what's wrong with you? She replies by gesturing. I don't understand you. What the deuce language is this? That's exactly the trouble, sir. She's lost the power of speech and so far no one has been able to find what the reason is. It has caused her marriage to be postponed. But why? The man she is to marry wishes to wait until she's recovered. But who is this idiot who doesn't want his wife to be dumb? Would to God mine had the same trouble. I shouldn't be wanting her cured. In a few lines, the whole meaning of this charade, this mental illness, is laid bare. Lucinda does not want to marry the man her father picked out for her and has succeeded in having the wedding postponed. Scannerell shows us that a wife's silence may be a curse or a blessing, and through it all, Molidre reveals that dumbness, such as Lucindy's, may be a blemish or blessing, or, in our terms, the symptom of an illness which Gadronte may want cured, but Lucinda may not. Of course, Moire makes no bones about Lucinda's faking being dumb, just as Scannerell fakes being a doctor. El Sandre, the young man Lucinda wants to marry, sums it up as follows, speaking to Scannerell. I wanted to tell you that this illness, which you are here to cure, is all put on, the doctors have done the usual diagnosis, and they've not hesitated to say how it arose. According to some, from the brain or the bowels, according to others, from the spleen or the liver. But the fact is that the real cause is love. Lucinde only assumed the symptoms in order to avoid being forced into a marriage with a man she detests. 
Soon Scannerell cures Lucinda, who having regained her voice, expresses herself only too clearly. No paternal authority can make me marry against my will. I have. I'll never submit to such tyranny. I'll shut myself up in a convent rather than marry a man I don't love. Oh, what a torrent of words. There's no doing anything with her. I implore you, sir, make her dumb again. That's the one thing I can't do. The only thing I can do to help you is make you deaf if you like. It would be gilding the lily to offer any comment on this exchange. I will say, however, that we have made progress since Moliere. Psychiatrists now know how to make a lucinda dumb again. Pretending to be mentally three. Psychiatry has a dual character and a correspondingly dual origin. One part, the older and most important, originates from the 17th century with the incarceration of insane persons in madhouses. The madmen and madwomen so treated, the furiously insane and the homicidal and suicidal maniacs, presented behaviors very different from those of medically sick persons. They acted crazy, not sick. Hence, these persons were not regarded as malingerers, that is, as healthy persons who pretended to be sick. Thus began asylum care and the insane asylum, which became psychiatry and the institutional psychiatric system as we now know them. Another part of psychiatry can be traced to a quite different origin, namely to the separation in the 19th century of neurological diseases such as general paresis and multiple sclerosis from mental diseases such as dementia praecox and hysteria. In contrast to the asylum doctors who cared for incarcerated madmen and madwomen, the neuropsychiatrists, typically professors in medical schools, were part neuropathologists and part clinicians, whose task was to distinguish persons with bona fide diseases of the nervous system from persons without such diseases, whose symptoms, however, resembled those of the former group of patients. For example, a young woman complained of inability to stand and loss of vision. Was she suffering from multiple sclerosis or was she merely pretending to be unable to stand and see? Another had seizures. Were they due to epilepsy or not? From this medical social matrix grew the second, more recent part of psychiatry, the part that comprised hysteria and neurosis, hypnosis and psychotherapy, and whose patients and practitioners were generally located without rather than within the mental hospital. See Table 6.1. Table 6.1, Psychiatry, Mental Illness, Mental Treatment, A Historical Schema. 17th Century, Birth of Institutional Psychiatry, Insanity, Incarceration in Insane Asylum, Not Yet Viewed as the Business of the Mad Doctor, Psychiatrist, Physician Treats Malingerer, Much as He Does Other Patients. 19th Century, Dementia Praecox, Mental Hospitalization, Institutional Psychiatry Becomes the Cornerstone of the Psychiatric Profession. Birth of psychotherapy, fake illness, malingering, becomes hysteria and the paradigm of neurosis. Fake treatment, charlatanry, becomes hypnosis and the paradigm of psychotherapy. Today, paradigm diagnosis, schizophrenia, paradigm treatment, involuntary mental hospitalization and coerced drug treatment. Malingering, hysteria, becomes factitious illness or personality disorder. Drug treatment, family therapy, hospitalization, sex therapy, and countless other interventions, all legitimized as bona fide medical treatments. The most important single figure in the development of this branch of psychiatry was Jean Martin Charcot, 1825 to 1893, a French neurologist who was the first to describe and identify several neurological diseases and is also credited with having claimed or discovered hysteria as a bona fide disease and hypnosis as a bond fide treatment for it. I suggest that we view hysteria as a pretense of being ill, the patient lying by means of bodily gestures rather than with words alone, although words too are typically employed, and that we view hypnosis as the pretense of curing, the physician lying by means of medical gestures, although he too uses words as well. It will be worth our while to briefly review the evidence for this interpretation. Georges Guillain, a student of Charcot's who himself became a famous neurologist, has told us, in no uncertain terms, that the poor women on whom Charcot made his original discoveries of hysteria were coached to malinger, that is, to pretend that they were epileptics. 
In 1899, about six years after Charcot's death, I, writes Guillain, saw as a young intern at the Salpetriere the old patients of Charcot who were still hospitalized. Many of the women, who were excellent comedians, when they were offered a slight pecuniary remuneration, imitated perfectly the major hysteric crises of former times. Who was fooling whom? The daisy chain went like this. Charcot's assistants and the poor patients they trained were fooling Charcot, Charcot was fooling his medical colleagues, and the medical profession was fooling the public. The result was that, in the end, everyone accepted simulated illness as real mental illness and mental illness as real bodily illness. The idea of a real, that is, bodily disease as a scientific concept is the product of the morgue, the autopsy table, arid the pathological laboratory. It was by examining dead bodies and their organs, tissues, and cells that physicians discovered various diseases and distinguished one such disease from another. That is not how mental diseases were discovered. The idea of mental illness is, as I have tried to show, the product of the insane asylum as theater. This model must be taken seriously. Like any theater, the madhouse comprised not only actors and audience, but also playwright and stage manager. It was by placing certain persons on the stages of insane asylums and watching their performances that physicians, as well as lay people to a degree unknown in the rest of medicine, discovered various mental diseases and distinguished one such disease from another. The theatrical atmosphere of the early insane asylum, where, like freaks in a circus, mad men and mad women were actually exhibited and expected to perform, is familiar to anyone conversant with the history of psychiatry. However, what is much less well known is that the discovery of mental illness, in the modern sense of that term, also occurred in that setting. I refer to the closing decades of the 19th century when, largely as a result of the work of the great French neurologists, diseases of the nervous system were separated from mental diseases, grand mal epilepsy serving as the model of neurological illness, and its imitation, grand hysteria, as the model of mental illness. Hypnosis was then thought to be a means for inducing hysterical seizures, as well as for curing them. This was the scene, as described by the famous physician author, Axel Munth. I seldom failed to attend Professor Charcot's famous Legon du Mardi in the Salptriere, just then chiefly devoted to his grand hysteria and to hypnotism. The huge amphitheater was filled to the last place with a multicolored audience drawn from tout Paris, authors, journalists, leading actors and actresses, fashionable demimondanes, all full of morbid curiosity to witness the startling phenomena of hypnotism almost forgotten since the days of Mesmer and Braid. It seems to me that there is something very wrong with this scene. Wrong, that is, if we consider how bodily diseases were discovered and studied. Obviously, this is not the sort of setting in which, say, Rudolf Virchow or Paul Ehrlich worked and made their discoveries. Instead, let us make no mistake about it. This is the setting of the faith healer, the charlatan, the circus performer, perhaps even of the political demagogue on his way up the political ladder from talking to killing. What is remarkable about all this, moreover, is that the diseases and cures of psychiatry continue to be discovered and presented in this way. Television producers and newscasters continue to regale the public with the astounding performances of mentally ill patients and their miraculous cures. Gripping anecdotes and shocking scenes of devastating disability and dramatic recovery fill the screens, the newspapers, magazines, and even psychiatric journals. These are legitimate methods for presenting life as theater, but are totally irrelevant to and inappropriate for a scientific effort to understand the human body as a material object. The upshot was that from about 1900 until the Second World War, physicians, psychiatrists, and lawyers recognized hysteria and malingering as two distinct and separate conditions, the first an illness, the second not. However, since the difference between them was that the former was supposedly due to unconscious and the latter to conscious motives, there was no objective or reliable way of telling them apart. Still, some psychiatric texts continued despite a fast-growing confusion between malingering and hysteria, to discuss malingering in a surprisingly reasonable, traditional way. For example, in 1969, in the 10th edition of the British text, 
Henderson and Gillespie's textbook of psychiatry, malingering is presented under the heading of hysteria and simulation. To distinguish sharply between hysteria and simulation is often arbitrary. Simulation is the voluntary production of symptoms by an individual who has full knowledge of their voluntary origin. In hysteria, there is typically no such knowledge. Kretschmer rightly pointed out, however, that the criteria, conscious or unconscious, will not serve to distinguish simulation from hysteria, for not all of the motives of the healthy mind are conscious, and not all hysterical ones are unconscious. Ernst Kretschmer, 1888-1964, was right, but did not go far enough. The adjectives conscious-unconscious, voluntary-involuntary, are ostensibly explanatory, but are actually strategic, see Chapter 9. Nevertheless, authoritative texts, for example, the Encyclopedia of Psychology, continue to define malingering by emphasizing that it is the voluntary production and presentation of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms, emphasis in the original, as if anyone could distinguish voluntary from involuntary production of symptoms, or as if anyone could present a symptom involuntarily. The attempt to distinguish between voluntary versus involuntary or conscious versus unconscious self-production of symptoms or lesions seems to me a potentially bottomless source of confusion. Surely, most people who smoke or overeat do not intend to make themselves sick with the symptoms and signs of atherosclerosis. Yet, insofar as that disease may, partly or wholly, be due to the consequences of such behaviors, it might be necessary to classify it as a type of malingering, a pretty absurd conclusion. One believe it would make more sense to view, say, atherosclerosis if it is indeed self-induced, as self-induced or autogenic, and then try to understand how and why people, deliberately or otherwise, give themselves this disease. Since health is not the only value in life, many autogenic diseases may be the results of trade-offs we more or less willingly make. For example, between experiencing the pleasures of eating certain foods or smoking cigarettes, and risking the discomfort and disability of certain diseases. Pretending to be insane. It should be noted that most of the literature on malingering concerns persons imitating being ill, not being insane. Indeed, if insanity does not exist, if, as I contend, mental illness is a metaphorical illness, how can it be imitated? The answer is that what a person imitates is not insanity, but the role of the insane person. Since acting crazy cannot be distinguished from being crazy, the person who wants to be taken for a madman has only to act like one. In this connection, the following vignette from Bleuler's original study of schizophrenia is of particular interest. Considering schizophrenia as a bona fide disease but without biological markers, as we would now say, Bleuler believed that it was possible to simulate schizophrenia just as it was possible to simulate other diseases. But how did he distinguish between real schizophrenia and its imitation? Here is how. A very special sort of unconscious disease simulation was shown by a patient who was accused by her supervisor of being crazy. From that moment on, she behaved as if she were crazy. While still living at home, she insisted that the house janitor was an attendant of an insane asylum, refused to take food, etc. After one tube feeding, there was a sudden cure. Tube feeding especially when unnecessary and unjustified, as in the foregoing case, is of course simply a method of torture, rationalized as treatment. Bleuler's handling of this patient and his unashamed description of it should serve as a stark reminder that people, especially physicians, have long understood that, as Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772-1834, put it, real pain alone cures us of imaginary ills. We feel a thousand miseries till we feel misery. It is this principle that has inspired the time-honored practice of curing the imaginary torments of the madman with the real tortures of the madoctor. The brief passage previously cited illustrates several other important points. It reveals, for example, that there was no real distinction, in Bleuler's mind, between the ensemble of human behaviors he considered to be schizophrenia and the imitation of that ensemble. For had this woman not recovered from the tube feeding, but, on the contrary, exhibited even more stubborn negativism, he would no doubt have concluded that she was a typical schizophrenic. However, since she was cured, schizophrenia then being characterized by being incurable, 
she was a malingerer. Finally, this vignette illustrates how much more free and justified psychiatrists then felt to punish patients they thought were malingering than they do now when psychiatric punishments are carefully concealed as treatments. Obviously, since there is no immediate need to tube feed a person who has just stopped eating, this highly unpleasant procedure was a pretty transparent form of torture, though not too bad a torture by current standards. It is worth adding that despite considering this patient as having been a malingerer, Bluler speaks of having cured her, surely a deplorable euphemism for what happened. Although many words in Bluler's book are placed between quotation marks, the word cure in the sentence previously quoted is not one of them. While deception pervades all human endeavors, it is expected to pervade some more than others. For example, politics and religion, unless one is devoutly religious, more, and science and medicine, less. Because I see the very nature of what we mean by mental illness as inherently deceptive, so long as we do not recognize this, the methods we use in an effort to cope with it are bound to be deceptive also. Thus, a good deal of what passes for research in psychiatry is also fundamentally fraudulent, not infrequently based on admittedly deceptive premises and procedures. For example, in 1972, David Rosenhan, a professor of psychology at Stanford University, set out to deliberately deceive a number of hospital psychiatrists. Rosenhan and several associates assumed the role of mental patients. They called themselves pseudo-patients by pretending to hear voices. They called up mental hospital psychiatrists, complained of this symptom, and gained admission to the hospital. Once inside the insane asylum, regardless of how sane the pseudo-patients acted, they continued to be regarded as crazy. With the exception of myself, I was the first pseudo-patient and my presence was known to the hospital administrator and chief psychologist and, so far as one can tell, to them alone," writes Rosenhan. The presence of the pseudo-patients and the nature of the research program was not known to the hospital staff. This deception was supposedly necessitated by the problem to be investigated. However distasteful such concealment is, it was a necessary first step to examining certain questions," explains Rosenhan. The questions he wanted explained were, if sanity and insanity exist, how shall we know them? And whether the sane can be distinguished from the insane, and whether the insane can be distinguished from each other. The trouble is that this so-called experiment was not premised on concealment as our double-blind studies, but rather on deception. The researchers impersonated psychotics and deliberately lied to the psychiatrists whose help they ostensibly solicited. Nevertheless, this study was accepted for publication in science and hailed as an important piece of research, supposedly proving the labeling theory of mental illness and the unreliability of the psychiatric diagnostic process. To me, it proves only that it is easy to deceive people, especially when they want to be deceived. Pretending to be possessed and dispossessed. Today, people believe that mental illness exists and is real. Hence arises the problem of distinguishing real cases of mental illness from simulated cases of it. It may surprise the contemporary reader that, not so many years ago, when people believed that diabolical possession existed and was real, they faced a similar problem, namely, having to distinguish real cases of possession from simulated cases of it. How, people may now wonder, could anyone pretend to be possessed or a witch? This question reveals how uneasy and uncertain we are about distinguishing between what the sociologists call the social construction of reality and what, let us just say, is a more solid, scientifically constructed reality. Actually, what the former term means is simply something like this. If a person, P, believes in X and thinks he is X, and if virtually everyone in his society also believes in X and legitimizes P as X, then P is X. For example, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, in their authoritative exposition of this perspective, write, rural Haitians are possessed and New York intellectuals are neurotic. Emphasis in the original. Well, yes and no, as I try to show throughout this book. Actually, the fact that someone thinks he is possessed or insane or a leader with God-given powers, together with the fact that most other members of society agree with him, establishes that person's identity as what he claims it to be only in a very limited or soft sense of this word. 
which Berger and Luckman recognize. For our present purposes, it suffices to note, however, that when belief in demonic possession was as dominant and popular as belief in psychosis is now, the authorities charged with dealing with possessed persons had problems concerning pretended possession very similar to those that authorities now have dealing with pretended insanity. Sad but true, a person's life can be so drab, his motivation so seemingly perverse, that sometimes he will pretend to be anyone or anything so long as it promises to dramatize or end his existence. Thus, when people believed in demonic possession and witchcraft, it was not unusual for individuals to pretend that they were possessed or were witches. For example, lonely old women sometimes did so in order to be put to death, an option that, for obvious reasons, they viewed as morally preferable to committing suicide. In his masterful study, Religion and the Decline of Magic, Keith Thomas tells of several women in 16th century England who were punished for fraudulently simulating the symptoms of possession. He also chronicles the cases of persons faking diabolical possession and of judges revolted by the severity of the law against witchcraft, exposing them as impostors and acquitting them of the charge of witchcraft. One such judge, Sir John Holt, Lord Chief Justice, 1689 to 1710, Thomas tells us, presided over some eleven successive acquittals and secured the conviction of the impostor for pretending to be afflicted with witchcraft. By his questions and manner of hemming up the evidence, remarked an observer, he seemed to me to believe nothing of witchery at all. His example was followed by his colleagues. Mr. Justice Powell, presiding over the trial of Jane Wenham in 1712, is said to have greeted the more sensational testimony with the cheerful remark that there was no law against flying. He took prompt steps to arrange for her reprieve. It seems that we shall have to wait until the next, or even some later, century before a judge dismisses a petition for commitment by cheerfully declaring that there is no law against having delusions or hallucinations, or against believing that one is Jesus, or against claiming that one can communicate with the FBI through the fillings in one's teeth. Still, as Thomas emphasizes, statutes against witchcraft made it difficult for judges to be liberal. As Lord Chief Justice North complained to the Secretary of State in 1682, we cannot reprieve them without appearing to deny the very being of witches, which is contrary to law. This complaint is a good example of the fact that legal fictions control those who judge no less than those who are judged, which, perhaps, is one of the reasons why such fictions endure so long, despite disbelief in them from above and displeasure over them from below. Moreover, since possession could, in both principle and practice, be cured by dispossession, some exorcists, not surprisingly, coached persons to simulate being possessed so as to then be able to dispossess them, a scenario later faithfully reenacted in the relationship between hysteric and hypnotist. Thomas records the story of such an exorcist who coached women to simulate being possessed and who was subsequently convicted by the High Commission as an imposter who had trained his patients to simulate the now conventional symptoms of the disorder in order to demonstrate his curative skills. Some of the most notable clergy of the day had been assistants at his dispossessions. This was so embarrassing that the subsequent controversy raised questions about the possibility of diabolical possession and the status of the cure by prayer and fasting. However, since most people wanted to believe in miracles, whether they tranquilized or horrified, they continued to believe in them. There were exceptions, of course, such as Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, who denounced the pretenses of exorcism and conjuration of phantasms. Though a devout Christian, or, as he insisted, because of it, he denounced the Roman Catholic Mass as also a pretense. But when, by such words, the priest's consecration, the nature of or quality of the thing itself, is pretended to be changed, it is not consecration, but either an extraordinary work of God or a vain and impious conjuration. Such conjuration, he hastened to add, is contrary to the testimony of man's sight and of all the rest of his senses. I similarly insist that the claim that the phenomena we now call mental illnesses are illnesses like cancer and heart disease is contrary to the testimony of man's sight and of all the rest of his senses.
To summarize, when, as in the Middle Ages, virtually everyone believed in possession, there arose the following phenomena and problems. Some people pretended to be possessed, some pretended to cure possession. Hence, it was necessary to distinguish real cases and cures of possession from pretended cases and cures of it. And finally, some persons denied the officially acclaimed doctrine of the miraculous transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of the Savior. Similarly, when as now, virtually everyone believes in mental illness, there arise the following phenomena and problems. Some people pretend to be insane. Some pretend to cure insanity. Hence, it is necessary to distinguish real cases and cures of insanity from pretended cases and cures of it. And finally, some persons deny the officially acclaimed doctrine of the miraculous transformation of personal problems into psychiatric diseases. Pretending to cure. Malingering is feigning illness. It is what the healthy person does when he pretends to be ill. What is the corresponding pretending on the part of the healer or physician? How do we view the non-physician pretending to be a physician? Or the physician who, without the faintest idea of what ails the patient or how to help him, pretends to diagnose and cure him? The non-physician who pretends to be a doctor is, of course, called a quack. However, the physician who pretends to diagnose without really knowing what ails the patient and to cure him without really knowing how is not necessarily categorized negatively. To be sure, he may be discredited as a charlatan, but more often than not, he is accredited merely because he is a bona fide physician, as a bona fide healer. Indeed, perhaps nothing illustrates more dramatically the profound bias built into our language than the definitions of and the meaning we ordinarily attach to the terms malingering and placebo. Actually, malingering is a something, a false complaint of illness that a patient gives to a physician, whereas a placebo is also a something, a false promise of treatment that a physician gives to a patient. Where is the bias? It is in the way we use these terms. Descriptively, malingering and placebo both refer to an act of imitation and a counterfeited object pretending to be ill and a simulated illness in one case, pretending to be prescribing a treatment and a simulated treatment in the other. To state it more fully, the malingerer is a person who plays the role of sick patient, who pretends to be ill and who presents doctors with faked symptoms and signs of illness. Whereas the prescriber of a placebo is a person who plays the role of physician healer, pretends to be trying to help a genuinely ill patient and provides the patient with the faked accoutrements of a supposedly needed pharmacologically active therapeutic agent. Of course, this is not at all the way these symmetrical acts of imitation are defined or understood in ordinary discourse. Webster's defines malingering as feigning illness, which implies not only that there is an identifiable and meaningful difference between real illness and fake illness, but also that the imitator is up to some mischief. By contrast, placebo is defined as a medicine given merely to satisfy a patient, which implies not only that it is a bona fide medicine, therapy, but also that the physician prescribing it is engaged in a praiseworthy enterprise. The vast political imbalance between the roles of patient and doctor, symbolized by malingering doing the work of a bad word, and placebo that of a good one point to a delicate issue. Namely, that throughout the entire history of medicine, from Hippocrates to our day, the physician's proper role has been seen as resembling that of the politician rather than that of the scientist. By this I mean simply that, as Plato had advocated, since both the politician and the physician labor in a good cause, they should be permitted to lie. The ethic of truth-telling characterizing science has thus been alien, if indeed not inimical, to the ethics of medicine. I touch here on a large subject whose importance for the entire practice of medicine in all of its reaches and ramifications cannot be overemphasized. However, it is a subject I cannot pursue further here. Suffice it for us to note that in her book on lying, philosopher Cicela Bach devotes an entire chapter to the way doctors deceive patients and comments cogently on deception as therapy. She emphasizes that principles and oaths of medical ethics have never placed any value on the doctor's veracity toward the patient. The Hippocratic Oath, she observes, makes no mention of truthfulness to patients about their condition, prognosis, or treatment.
other early codes and prayers are equally silent on the subject. The Nuremberg Code and the principles of medical ethics of the American Medical Association also make no reference to truthfulness. It makes no sense, however, to gnash our teeth over this, assuming we despise medical despotism concealed as therapeutic paternalism. The only thing that makes sense is to bring this matter to the attention of the public. It is all too clear that unless a particular patient has reason to believe that his physician is and will be truthful with him, he has no reason or duty to be truthful with the physician. Sadly, it will probably be in the patient's best interest not to be so. The litigious posture patients have come to assume toward physicians may in no small part be due to this unjustifiable imbalance concerning the expectation to tell the truth between doctor and patient. If a physician wants to help his patient, especially in our day of undreamt, of possibilities for doing so, he has no need to resort to fraud or force vis-a-vis -vis the patient. His knowledge and skills are enough. More than ever before, the physician could now let himself be guided by the principle that a word to the wise is sufficient. If the patient does not want to take the physician's word, why should that matter to the physician, or vice versa? Neither doctor nor patient ought to use or tolerate the use of fraud or force in their relationship to each other. On the other hand, if the patient lies to the doctor, and vice versa, if both parties accept the lies as truths, and if both then manipulate each other with escalating strategies of deception and counter-deception, then the result will be that the medical situation will continue on its precipitously downhill course, each party trying to con rather than to cooperate with the other. The fact that today psychiatrists, physicians, and even the general public accept both real and faked illnesses as bona fide diseases and both real and faked treatments as bona fide treatments is a symptom of the malignant power ideologically even more than politically that the medical profession now wields over the mind of modern man. This power is also largely responsible for the profound conceptual confusion that pervades our healthcare system and the economic and legal chaos toward which, as a practical enterprise, it seems to be heading. To see how we got where we are now, it might help to briefly review the history of the physicians, or rather, for the sake of economy, the psychiatrists pretending to cure. Psychiatry pretending to cure. Study of the writings of the pioneer psychiatrists clearly shows that they viewed insane patients as deceivers, and themselves as counter-deceivers. Indeed, they saw the essence of the patient's illness in his succeeding to deceive himself and in his trying to deceive the doctor as well. Similarly, they saw the essence of the doctor's cure in his succeeding to undeceive the patient, which fully justified the use of appropriate methods of counter-deception. Thus were insane and untruthful patients to be restored to sanity and truthfulness. It would be no exaggeration to say that at the beginning of the 19th century, the asylum doctor regarded the madman as insane because he lied, and that he believed the madman lied because he was insane. Similarly, the asylum doctor regarded himself as sane because, as a man of reason and a scientist, he told the truth even when he lied, because he lied not to lie, but only to bring the patient to the truth. Lying, asserted Benjamin Rush, 1745-1813, the father of American psychiatry, is a corporeal disease. Persons thus diseased cannot speak the truth upon any subject. Shamelessly, Rush articulated the modern psychiatrist's credo that the madman is irrational because he disagrees with the psychiatrist. There was a time when these things, criticism of his opinions and actions, irritated and distressed me. But now I hear and see them with the same indifference and pity that I hear the ravings and witness the antic gestures of my deranged patients in our hospital. We often hear of prisoners at large. The majority of mankind are madmen at large. Convinced that his patients were self-deceived and deceiving, he enthusiastically advocated deceiving them in order to cure them. If our patient imagines he has a living animal in his body and he cannot be reasoned out of a belief of it, medicines must be given to destroy it. And if an animal, such as he supposes to be in his body, should be secretly conveyed into his close stool, the deception would be a justifiable one if it served to cure him of his disease. 
In addition to the coercion implicit in incarcerating his patients, deception formed the very foundations of Russia's efforts to treat them. Here is another example of one of his cures. Cures of patients who suppose themselves to be glass may be easily performed by pulling a chair upon which they are about to sit from under them and a herward showing them a large collection of pieces of glass as the fragments of their bodies. It's a pathetic scene. Russia's patients are convinced that they have living animals in their bodies, they might have had intestinal parasites, or that they are made of glass, surely a fine poetic way of saying one is weak and vulnerable. And for that, Rush diagnoses them as insane. At the same time, Rush convinces himself that insanity is a disease of the brain, not of the mind, and yet believes that he can cure it by means of such childish stratagems. The psychiatric scene has not changed very much since those days. The patients still often propound lies, claims, and metaphors, and the psychiatrists still often propound counter-lies diagnoses and treatments. Much of modern psychiatry consists of a compounding of these prevarications, the lies steadily concealed by a ceaseless relabeling of the patient's deceptions as new diseases and the psychiatrists as new treatments. Nor, as I now want to quickly show, are psychiatric research and teaching free of the pervasive dishonesty that, as I see it, is an inevitable consequence and must become an integral part of any enterprise based on nothing but deception and coercion. Pretending to do research and teach. The following example illustrates not only the pervasiveness of deception in psychiatry, but also its acceptance by psychiatrists as legitimate and indeed scientific, provided the pretender is a psychiatrist. Attending the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association in Atlanta in May 1978, Natalie Shanus, a well-known psychoanalyst in New York City, arrived late in the evening at the Omni Hotel. I was unpacking, she writes, when my phone rang about 11.30 p.m. Wondering who might be calling at that hour, I picked up the phone receiver to hear a man's voice say, would you like us to send up a gentleman to pleasure you? Offended by the offer, Shaness interrogated the hotel manager about the incident, only to learn that a member of the American Psychiatric Association was conducting a piece of sex research and had arranged for 25 women arriving alone to receive this call, emphasis added. By representing himself as a scientific investigator, the unidentified psychiatrist deceived not only his victims, but also the hotel manager. The American Psychiatric Association never exposed the identity of this imposter. Perhaps the ultimate in psychiatric pretending is the pretense, perpetrated by certain psychiatric educators, of presenting pseudo-instruction about mental illness. In 1972, Independently of David Rosenhan's scheme to deceive psychiatrists by means of pseudo-patients, Donald Naftulin, a University of Southern California psychiatrist, devised a scheme to deceive mental health educators by means of a pseudo-psychiatrist. The result was predictable. Just as psychiatrists were unable to distinguish pseudo-patients from real patients, so mental health educators were unable to distinguish pseudo-psychiatrist from real psychiatrist. In fact, the pseudo-psychiatrist was rated an outstanding psychiatrist. The purpose of this experiment, according to the investigators, was to determine if there was a correlation between a student's satisfaction with a lecturer and the degree of cognitive knowledge required. We hypothesized that given a sufficiently impressive lecture paradigm, even experienced educators participating in a new learning experience can be seduced into feeling satisfied that they have learned despite irrelevant, conflicting, and meaningless content by the lecturer. To this end, the team hired a professional actor who looked distinguished and sounded authoritative, named him Dr. Myron L. Fox, bestowed upon him the persona of an authority on the application of mathematics to human behavior, created a bogus curriculum vitae, and coached him in a speech entitled Mathematical Game Theory as Applied to Physician Education. The experimenters coached Dr. Fox's to teach charismatically and non-substantively on a topic about which he knew nothing, instructing him to use double talk and other trickery in the question and answer period, and to intersperse the nonsense with parenthetical humor and meaningless references to unrelated topics. The lecture was first presented to a group of 11 psychiatrists, 
psychologists, and social work educators and was videotaped. The tape was then shown to a group of 11 psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychiatric social workers, and finally to a group of 33 educators and administrators taking a graduate course in educational philosophy. All 55 subjects were asked to answer a questionnaire evaluating their response to the lecture. The audience loved Dr. Fox. All respondents had significantly more favorable than unfavorable responses. One even believed he had read Dr. Pa Fox's publications. Among the subjective responses quoted by the investigators were the following. Excellent presentation, enjoyed listening, good analysis of the subject, knowledgeable. What does this experiment about the pseudo-psychiatrist as educator prove? To Naftalin and his colleagues, it proves that if a lecturer talks at a group with no participation permitted to the group, a question and answer period was, however, permitted, then a mellifluous, trained actor might do just as well, possibly better than an uncharismatic physician. That is not what it proves to me. Like the Rosenhan pseudo-patient study, the Naftulin pseudo-psychiatrist study proves only that when it comes to the institutionalized deception of psychiatry, observers trained in mental health are unable to distinguish fake fakes from real fakes. Not exactly a surprising conclusion. As if to support this contention, Naftulin and his co-workers offer this conclusion, couched in the appropriate gobbledygook. The study supports the possibility of training actors to give legitimate lectures as an innovative educational approach toward student-perceived satisfaction with the learning process. The authors do not explain why medical students or their parents would want to pay the huge tuition fees charged by medical schools to listen to actors talk about non-existent subjects. No doubt they envision a system of psychiatric education patterned in the tradition of psychiatric diagnosis and treatment, true facts being mendaciously misdescribed every step of the way. Patient and Doctor as Liars, Recapitulation and Review As one have tried to show, impersonating the patient role, feigning illness, and malingering all refer to a type of verbal or nonverbal behavior we ordinarily call lying. Curiously, it is now taboo to use the word lying in connection with both mental patients and psychiatrists. We act as if we believe that psychiatrists are too honest ever to lie, and that mental patients are somehow too sick to lie, and hence can do so only unconsciously. The fact that even as intrepid a thinker as Barrows Dunham repeats this empty slogan like some sacred incantation suggests how heretical it now is to say that mental patients lie. Lunatics, he writes, deceive themselves, but they do not do it consciously, and so do not lie. Elsewhere, Dunham reveals that he sees lying by mental patients and others rather more clearly. Organizations, he writes, thus feel the same need to distort reality which lunatics privately feel. They feel it, indeed, rather more strongly than lunatics. For, in organizational lying, the moral deterrent has been removed. The liar affects his lie, so it seems, not from self-interest, but from loyalty to the group. There is even a kind of self-sacrifice about it. The organizational liar surrenders his integrity to the common good. The behavior of the loyal psychiatrist, especially in connection with the definition of mental illness, see Chapter 3, exemplifies what Barrows calls organizational lying. Of course, it is obvious that all human beings lie some of the time and that some lie more often than others, and some more dramatically or bizarrely than others. Not so long ago, intelligent people generally believed that physicians and lunatics lied more often and more brazenly than others. Now they believe, and are expected to believe, that these two groups of persons never lie. Contemporary opinion regarding lying by mental patients and psychiatrists thus represents a complete reversal of the opinion that prevailed less than 200 years ago. As we saw, it was then widely held that while all human beings lied, madmen and physicians were cheats on an especially grand scale. Today, the mental patient is treated as if he had completely lost his ability to lie, while the psychiatrist is treated as if he could not lie, because his lies, being therapeutically motivated, are not really lies at all. From malingering to hysteria, from quackery to psychotherapy, Assuming that persons lie and that mental patients and psychiatrists are persons, we should expect them to lie also. Indeed they do. When mesmerism and its inventor, 
Franz Anton Mesmer, 1734-1815, flourished, critical observers had no trouble regarding the sufferers as malingerers and the healers as mountebanks. There are, observed Benjamin Franklin, no greater liars than quacks, except for their patients. Franklin knew this to be the case, partly because he was level-headed and partly because he had been a member of the French Royal Commission, appointed by Louis XVI in 1784, charged with investigating Mesmer's cures by means of animal magnetism. The commission concluded, in aphoristically terse French, l'imagination fait tout, le magnetism nul. Imagination is everything, magnetism nothing. Franklin was not fooled. As to animal magnetism so much talked of, he wrote, I must doubt its existence. I cannot but fear that the expectation of great advantage from this method of treating disease will prove a delusion. Actually, it was precisely because the performances of both malingerers and magnetizers smelled so badly of deception that they were renamed and reconceptualized. What began as cheating and lying ended up as bona fide diseases and treatments. Although physicians probably lie more often than patients, their lies have traditionally been excused and even extolled on the ground that they serve the patient's interest rather than the doctor's. This, of course, is paternalism at its most invincible. The liar not only lies, but, because his aims are noble, demands a license for his mendacity. The pillars of society thus not only grant the doctor the right to lie, but authenticate his lies as truths. This is why the patient's lies about being sick were first seen as malingering, then as hysteria, and now as various types of mental diseases, all blemishes, if not on the patient's character, then on his mental health. Appropriately enough, this has turned out to be a distinction without much of a difference. And why the physician's lies about being able to cure, condemned, and ridiculed as quackery in the 18th century, soon became respected as hypnosis, and are now glorified as the scientific treatment of mental illness. Since the story of the evolution of pretended illnesses is more familiar than that of pretended treatments. I herewith offer a brief list of the latter. In Moliere's day, the doctor who conned his malingering patients, or his genuinely sick patients for that matter, was viewed as a crook and a quack. By the end of the 18th century, thanks to Mesmer, he was, at least for a time, seen as a miracle worker, curing by means of animal magnetism, later called mesmerism. By the middle of the 19th century, he was more successfully mystified and glorified as a hypnotist. Today, he is regarded as practicing scientific psychotherapy. Why do I call hypnosis a lie? Isn't it a real and effective treatment? It is ironic that physicians claimed and people came to believe that hypnosis was a real legitimate treatment because it worked. To do what? To dispel the patient's pains. But didn't the patient's lie, his hysterical complaint that he feels pain, also work? Didn't it convince relatives, employers, and doctors that the patient was truly disabled and diseased? After all, what is the classic paradigm of malingering? The patient plaintively asserting that he feels pain, is paralyzed, or is blind. And what is the corresponding paradigm of mental healing? The doctor authoritatively commanding, your pain is gone, you can walk, you can see. At the height of their popularity around the turn of the last century, these twin lies were named, respectively, hysteria and hypnosis. They are real in the same sense in which possession and exorcism were real, that is, as social constructs. The term psychotherapy is barely 100 years old. Moreover, Daniel Hack Tuke, 1827-1895, the English psychiatrist who introduced it in 1872, intended it to mean something quite different from what we now mean by it. Tuke defined psychotherapeutics, which was the original form of the word, as the treatment of disease by the influence of the mind on the body. In other words, Tuke used the term to identify what he considered to be a particular method for treating bodily illness, whereas we now use it principally to identify a particular method for treating mental illness. This might be the proper place for me to add a further remark on the problem of whether a malingerer's imitation of illness is conscious or unconscious. One of the most effective psychiatric selling points behind the idea of hysteria as something other and more real than feigning illness was the claim that the patient was not conscious of what he was doing. 
I submit that this is just another way of saying that liars are generally more convincing if they believe their own lies than if they do not. Clearly, liars who do not believe their own lies have to be good actors, whereas those who do believe their own lies need only to be good cowards. The same considerations apply, of course, to the physician's lies about curing. Mesmer believed in animal magnetism. The 19th century French hypnotists believed in hypnotism. Breuer believed in catharsis. And Freud believed in psychoanalysis. This is why they were so effective in persuading others that these purely interpersonal relations were, in fact, bona fide treatments that effectively cured bona fide diseases. Much of this may seem obvious. It is indeed obvious to me. It has long been obvious to playwrights and novelists, and it may be obvious to the reader, especially after he has read this far. Actually, the suspicion that mental illness is a form of malingering, a pretense of being ill, has plagued psychiatrists for a long time, and only recently have they convinced themselves that their patients are truly ill. However, they have never convinced the man of letters. Neurosis, observed Marcel Proust, has an absolute genius for malingering. There is no illness which it cannot counterfeit perfectly. If it is capable of deceiving the doctor, how should it fail to deceive the patient? Replacing the illness with the treatment, Sartre remarked that psychoanalysis substitutes for the notion of bad faith, the idea of a lie without a liar. These aphoristic observations are, of course, couched in figurative language, Proust and Sartre knew perfectly well that neither neurosis nor psychoanalysis can counterfeit or lie. Only a person can do that. Let us see now why physicians regard persons who lie about being ill as bona fide patients suffering from bona fide illnesses. Understanding their reasoning and justifications will perhaps explain why physicians, especially psychiatrists, who lie about diseases and treatments regard themselves as bona fide researchers, discoverers, diagnosticians, and therapists. Illness, confusing phenomenon, cause, and consequence. Since the imitation of illness depends on an understanding of and agreement on what the thing is that is being imitated, we must periodically come back to square one, namely to our definition of the core concept of illness. The canons of science, not to mention common sense, require that regardless of how we choose to identify illness, our criteria be phenomenological. In other words, we must define illness in terms of what we can see, hear, or measure, that is, in terms of something material and observable. As I showed earlier, confusing and equating illness as a phenomenon with its actual or alleged cause, etiology, or its actual or possible or probable consequence, disability death, is a typical tactic of psychiatric propaganda as well as a fertile source of misunderstanding about what is a real illness as against a else illness or a mental illness. A confused commingling of phenomenon, cause, and consequence characterizes much of the writings of psychiatrists purporting to prove that mental illnesses are diseases. For example, schizophrenia is said to be a disease because it is caused by a genetic metabolic defect, a schizophrenogenic mother, or a sick society. Almost any cause will do. Psychiatrists who write this way mislead the reader into tacitly accepting that schizophrenia, whatever it is, is a disease and that our only problem is how to cure or prevent it. Similarly, alcoholism is said to be a disease because it results in cirrhosis of the liver and death. Anorexia nervosa is a disease because it results in cachexia and death, and so forth. Again, instead of establishing by phenomenological criteria, that drinking or self-starvation are diseases, persons who write this way mislead people into tacitly accepting that they are and that our only problem is how to cure or prevent them. The following paragraph is illustrative. The attitude of people who deny the very existence of mental disease, writes Guzet, include a number of different strands. First, we have the contention that disease does not exist in the absence of some anatomic or physiologic abnormality which, of course, cannot be demonstrated in most kinds of mental illness. The answer, known to most physicians, is that the cause of not a few general medical disorders, hypertension being a good example, also has eluded us, emphasis added. Note the author's casual switch from disease as phenomenon, identified by anatomical and physiological criteria, absent in mental illness, to disease as effect, identified by etiological criteria, present in mental illness.
Like all loyal psychiatrists, Guz refuses to be bound by an objectively identifiable criterion of illness. Instead, he simply declares that certain behaviors constitute illnesses and then speculates about their causes and dramatizes their consequences. Acute depression and acute anxiety, for example, are illnesses, writes Guz. How does he know this? By knowing that these deviations can incapacitate or even, as with the suicidal depressive, destroy the sufferer. So, of course, can famine and war. Fictitious and factitious illness, pretending to be three and producing illness. The confusion of bodily illness with the patient role is now equally pervasive in medicine and psychiatry. For example, in 1984, the prestigious British medical journal The Lancet published an article by Roy Meadow, a pediatrician, titled Fictitious Epilepsy. Meadow describes 36 cases of faked seizures, never questioning that persons who claim to have non-existent seizures or induced seizures in others or themselves are ill and in need of medical attention. Fictitious epilepsy is not rare. It is not surprising that false epilepsy is common, for it is easy to fabricate. One bonus that came the way of many of these families was considerable support from social services by way of attendance allowances, nursery places, privileged car parking, free school meals, and disability allowances. At least one family has ended up with more than 100 pounds per week in allowances as a result of false illness. The language Meadow uses to describe his observations cripples his thinking and predetermines his conclusion. He refers to extensive investigation and treatment for epilepsy because of false seizures invented or induced by a relative, and asserts that for 18 children, recurrent seizures were the only false illness, emphasis added. Actually, in most of the cases reported, relatives made false claims about their children having had seizures. Properly speaking, these reporters were lying and the children had no disease at all. The claim that one's child has seizures when he does not is no different, logically and grammatically, than the claim that one's basement is full of gold or water when it is not. In a few of the cases reported, relatives induced seizures in children by partially suffocating them with a hand, pillow, or plastic bag. Properly speaking, these male factors were assaulting their victims, causing them to have real seizures. Nevertheless, the author consistently refers to these phenomena also as false seizures. Not once does Meadow speak of assault, injury, or the deliberate causation of real illness. Obviously, human behavior is one of the most important causes or sources of illness. People injure others and make them ill in countless ways, for example, by boxing, reckless driving, exposure to toxic environments, war. Similarly, people injure themselves and make themselves ill in countless ways, for example, by eating too much or too little, ingesting toxic chemicals, exposing themselves to grave risks, cutting and shooting themselves. In other words, some diseases, for example, hemophilia or systemic lupus erythematosus, happen to people without their participation or volition. Others, for example, the cachexia of anorexia nervosa or the self-mutilation of a psychotic, are the results of certain habits or are purposefully self-induced. In addition, certain persons who are not ill want to be treated as if they were and therefore imitate being ill and try to assume the role of patient. In the vast literature on malingering, these two quite different phenomena, that is, pretending to be sick by faking the appearance of illness and making oneself sick by causing real illness, are hopelessly combined and confused, as the following example illustrates. A recent article titled Factitious Illness, an Exploration in Ethics, published in Perspectives in Biology and Medicine, begins with the vignettes of three patients exhibiting what the authors call factitious illnesses. A woman hospitalized for fever due to systematic self-injections of her own saliva. A non-diabetic woman with hypoglycemia due to repeated self-injections of insulin. And a woman who sought medical care for stones in her urine that proved to be her mother's gallstones. In my opinion, the behavior of all three of these persons constitutes malingering. However, the condition of the first two women who have produced real, identifiable lesions in themselves differs radically from that of the third woman who has merely impersonated or played the patient role. Perhaps all this is obvious. However, it is not the way authors interpret their own observations. 
Although they say that they recognize the phenomenon of malingering, they insist that none of their patients is a malingerer. This makes sense only if we assume that they are more interested in legitimizing these claimants as patients, their problems as diseases, and themselves as diagnosticians than they are in understanding the phenomena they address. According to the authors, the difference between malingering and factitious illness is that, while factitious illness is often chronic, malingering is usually situation-specific. Furthermore, although malingering is motivated by manifest secondary gains, in factitious illness, there are no apparent goals other than the bizarre psychological significance of being a patient. This is what happens when physicians fail to distinguish between illness as a demonstrable bodily abnormality and the sick role as a social construct and status. But this confusion karma be due to stupidity. More likely, it is due to the simple fact, so memorably satirized by Moliere, that doctors need patients, real patients, that is, persons with demonstrable bodily diseases seeking medical help are of course the best. But if they are in short supply, any other kind will do. Thus, fake patients, healthy persons who pretend to be ill, can and must, because they are mentally ill, be treated as mental patients. While persons who literally make themselves ill but do not want to be patients, can and must, because they are dangerously ill, be treated as involuntary patients. Pretending to be ill and making oneself ill. In modern, Western societies, people often claim to be ill when they are not, that is, they pretend to be ill or offer illness as an excuse or white lie. For example, people plead a minor illness in person or more often over the telephone to avoid an unpleasant social obligation or to stay away from work. Witnessing such behavior, children learn from an early age that they too may be able to avoid going to school or other unpleasant duties by complaining of an upset stomach or headache. As they get older, they learn more sophisticated methods of malingering, such as producing a fever by placing the thermometer near a light bulb. We must be clear about what this sort of malingering is and is not. It is the assertion of false or fraudulent complaints about the body that is misinformation. It is not the production of a bodily lesion, that is, illness. In other words, such persons define themselves as ill and assume, usually for a brief period, the sick role. They play being ill the same way children play being doctor or fireman or actors play Hamlet. A completely different situation, also called malingering, is involved in the case of a person who assumes the sick role not by making false or fraudulent complaints about his body, but by actually making himself ill. In the first case, a healthy person complains about feeling and being ill, for example, by faking the pain of renal colic. In the second case, a healthy person makes himself ill and then presents evidence of actual illness, for example, an amputated penis. Clearly, the diseases we inflict on ourselves are just as real as the diseases others inflict on us or that afflict us without the deliberate intervention of human agents. Whether or not a person has a disease does not depend, and should not be made to depend on what causes it, although understanding its causation is very important and inevitably influences our attitude toward it. Autogenic or self-induced illnesses. Although malingering has traditionally been viewed as a psychiatric problem, physicians and even medical philosophers now generally accept the proposition that pretending to be ill and producing illness by injuring oneself both now called factitious illnesses, are all bona fide diseases. Since this view rests on and embodies a commingling of the concepts of bodily lesion and the role of patient ideas, I am anxious to distinguish from one another. I should at this point like to propose a terminological and conceptual clarification. Table 6.2, Types of Autogenic Illness, Factitious Illness, Malingering. Production of Self-Injury with Complaint, for example, self-inflicted gunshot wound in soldier who wants to avoid hazardous duty, factitious illness with lesion and desire to be a patient. Faking being ill without self-injury, for example, false complaint of stomachache by child wishing to avoid going to school, factitious illness with desire to be a patient but without lesion. Production of self-injury, directly or indirectly, without complaint, for example, a young man who amputates his penis, schizophrenia, or a young woman who starves herself, anorexia nervosa, 
factitious illness with lesion but without desire to be a patient. No faking of being ill, no production of self-injury, no factitious illness, no patient. To begin with, what characterizes so-called factitious illnesses is that they are self-induced. Accordingly, I shall call them autogenic diseases. Secondly, the term factitious illness is unsatisfactory for another, even more important reason. Namely, because strictly speaking, some factitious illnesses are not illnesses at all, but merely impersonations of the patient role. Whereas certain others are not factitious, because the patients exhibit lesions every bit as real as those exhibited by patients with non-factitious illnesses. Finally, because autogenic diseases are produced by, and are diagnosed on the basis of, two independently variable factors, namely, false complaints of being ill and the self-induction, directly or indirectly, of actual lesions of bodily illness, we can readily distinguish three quite different kinds of problems now lumped together as factitious illnesses. See Table 6.2. Perhaps the best way to illustrate what I have just described abstractly is by considering the simplest cause of illness and death in a human being, or any living thing, namely, depriving the organism or person of food. Clearly, a person may suffer the ill effects of starvation, such as malnutrition and death, for several quite different reasons. He may be a prisoner of war deprived of food. He may be a civilian prisoner on a hunger strike as a form of political protest. Or he may starve himself for certain personal reasons. In each of these cases, the result of prolonged starvation is the same, disease and death. In the first case, the disease is considered to be inflicted on the subject by his captors. In the second case, although the starvation might be regarded as self-inflicted, it is not likely to be viewed as a form of malingering, and its consequences are accepted as real diseases. Sometimes authorities accept such behavior as a legitimate political act, and the prisoner is allowed, in effect, to kill himself. At other times, the authorities refuse to accept such behavior and forcibly feed treat the prisoner. In the third case, medical and psychiatric authorities refuse to regard the starvation as deliberately self-induced. Instead, they define the subject as a patient suffering from a disease called anorexia nervosa, which, they claim, causes the food avoidance. These examples illustrate how our perception of a phenomenon may be colored and confused by the way medical or political authorities treat them and the names they give them. When an Irish Republican army prisoner in a British jail starves himself, no one claims that he suffers from anorexia politica and that his self-starvation is anything other than a personal choice. However, when a young woman in America starves herself, psychiatrists claim, and everyone concurs, that she suffers from anorexia nervosa and that her self-starvation is not a personal choice but the result of a serious mental illness. One more example illustrating the intimate connections between faking disease, self-induced disease, and mental disease should suffice. In wartime, it is not unusual for a soldier to suffer a bullet wound. If the wound is inflicted by the enemy, the soldier is considered to be a hero and is decorated. If, on the other hand, the wound is self-inflicted, then the soldier is considered to be a malingerer and may be imprisoned or even executed. Surgically, a bullet wound is a bullet wound regardless of how it is acquired, whereas legally, a person with a bullet wound may be an assailant, the victim of an assailant, his own victim, or an innocent bystander. In sum, illness, defined as a lesion, is a phenomenon that may be caused by many agencies, among them pathogenic microorganisms, poisons, accidents, other people, or the subject patient himself. I suggest that we designate self-induced diseases, lesions, as autogenic. Such phenomena must be distinguished from the impersonations of the patient role by persons who are neither suffering from an illness nor making themselves ill. The concept of autogenesis offers a precise criterion for identifying self-induced bodily conditions that physicians regard as diseases and thus allow us to see the similarities as well as the differences between various diseases, some now classified as factitious and others not. For example, in Charcot's day, the paradigmatic autogenic disease was grand hysteria, while today it is anorexia nervosa. I classify both as autogenic because both are entirely self-induced or self-willed by the patient. That is how they resemble each other. Yet each differs from the other 
in that the person who pretends to have seizures imitates being ill, whereas the person who starves herself makes herself ill. The former runs the risk of perishing existentially through chronic hospital dependency, while the latter runs the risk of perishing biologically through malnutrition and inanition. In short, like the whale and the cow that resemble each other in the way they bear and feed their young, and differ in that one lives in the oceans and the other does not. So Charcot's hysteria and the DSM-3's anorectic resemble each other in the way they make themselves the objects of medical attention, but differ in that one wants to be the object of such attention and the other does not. Malingering, Leishan and Roll. As this analysis demonstrates, there are two entirely different kinds of behaviors that physicians regard as malingering, each resulting in a different kind of situation. One type of behavior consists of pretending to be ill by faking symptoms or signs of illness and seeking the care of physicians in hospitals. The other consists of producing self-injury or making oneself ill by an acute act or a chronic habit, but not seeking or even actively avoiding the services of physicians and hospitals. Not surprisingly, both types of behaviors, as well as the persons who engage in them, make doctors angry, but for very different reasons. The first type of person, because he is, as the physician sees it, healthy, but wants to be a patient. The second type, because he is, as the physician sees it, sick, but does not want to be a patient. Feeling deceived in the first case and frustrated in the second, the physician feels justified in retaliating. How he punishes the patient changes with medical fashions. For example, as recently as 1957, a feature article in the Journal of the American Medical Association described persons who impersonate sick patients as an economic threat to hospitals and an extreme nuisance to doctors and proposed that they be punished by permanent custodial care in a mental hospital. The logic was sound. Fake illness requires fake treatment. It has since become both more expensive and more difficult to incarcerate persons indefinitely in mental hospitals, which is perhaps one of the reasons why malingerers of this type are now punished merely with stigmatizing psychiatric diagnoses and psychiatric drugs. The second type of behavior, exemplified by the person who eats too much or too little, makes doctors feel frustrated by the fact that an individual whom physicians regard as a sick patient refuses to be a patient. Like the Russian intellectual who rejects and resists the Soviet ideology and is therefore called a political refusenik, the medically sick non-patient rejects and resists the medical ideology and might therefore also be called a medical refusenik. And once again, the doctor's punishment fits the non-patient's crime. The non-patient is forced to become a patient. Indeed, the deceptive coercive treatment of autogenic diseases such as drug abuse, chemical dependency, alcoholism, smoking, anorexia nervosa, obesity, is now one of the fastest growing segments of the medical industry. Why do I emphasize these seemingly obvious distinctions? Because psychiatry stands or falls on its ability and power to confuse and obliterate them. As we have seen, psychiatrists begin by confusing the differences between bodily illnesses and mental illnesses. They insist that mental illnesses are bodily illnesses, that they are like bodily illnesses, and that they are also different from bodily illnesses. Next, psychiatrists confuse the differences between a bodily lesion and the patient role. They insist that assuming the patient role in the absence of illness is itself an illness. According to the APA, the diagnosis of a factitious disorder always implies psychopathology, most often a severe personality disorder. But if it is psychiatrically correct to conclude that a person who says he is ill is ill only because he claims he is, then it is also correct to conclude that a person who says he is the emperor of China is the emperor of China because he claims he is. Of course, psychiatrists stop short before reaching that conclusion, and for an obvious reason, they have a vested interest in illnesses, real or false, but have no vested interest in personal identities. Thus, when a person assumes a false identity, for example, by claiming that he is Jesus, the psychiatrists do not say that he is Jesus. They say he is having a delusion and is sick. The point of the game, after all, is not to agree with the patient, but to authenticate an illness. I might add that when it comes to faking illnesses, psychiatrists indulge their patients and themselves equally.
Thus, when the professional manufacturers of madness fabricate mental illnesses, as they have done in the past with masturbatory insanity and homosexuality, and more recently with pathological gambling and paraphilic rapism, their colleagues eagerly authenticate these fabrications as real diseases. There is an important exception to this rule, however. It applies only to psychiatrists who serve the same ideological and political master. This is why American and Russian psychiatrists often differ in psychiatric diagnoses in general and on the psychopathology of specific patients in particular. Moreover, as if they hadn't created enough confusion already by claiming that healthy persons who assume the sick role are ill and by treating non-lesions as if they were lesions, psychiatrists now also claim that real lesions are not real lesions if they are self-inflicted. Under the caption of Factitious Disorders with Physical Symptoms, DSM-3 offers this astonishing denial of the reality of real lesions. The essential feature is the presentation of physical symptoms that are not real. The presentation may be self-inflicted, as in the production of abscesses by injection of saliva into the skin. If such abscesses are not real abscesses, then persons who kill themselves are not really dead, a conclusion characteristic of current psychiatric logic. Simulating and dissimulating insanity, we are ready now to consider psychiatry's classic twin riddles, namely the problems of sane persons pretending to be insane and vice versa. The former is usually called feigning insanity, the latter dissimulating insanity. Both terms imply that just as a rich person can pretend to be a poor person and vice versa, so a sane person can pretend to be an insane person and vice versa. The trouble, once again, is that since there are no objective tests for ascertaining whether a person is mentally healthy or mentally sick, there can be no way of determining or knowing whether he is really insane or only feigning insanity and whether he is really sane or merely dissimulating insanity. This is one of the reasons why psychiatrists love the idea of simulating dissimulating insanity so much. Regardless of what their examinations reveal or what they say, they cannot be proven wrong. In order to solve these riddles, it is necessary to situate them in the social contexts in which they typically arise. The riddle of whether insanity is real or simulated arises typically when, for example, a person in the military service feigns or is suspected of feigning insanity in order to be separated from the service. The serviceman claims by word or deed that he is crazy, while the authorities who have power over him claim he is not. The opposite riddle, namely whether sanity is real or the product of successful dissimulation of insanity, arises typically when, for example, a previously normal and perhaps even greatly admired person commits a shocking crime. Those in authority over him may now claim that his embarrassing behavior proves not only his present insanity, but also that he had been insane in the past and that his seemingly sane behavior was merely the result of his successful dissimulation of insanity. The subject, if still alive, is likely to insist that he is sane and has always been perfectly sane. Scrutinizing the way psychiatrists conceptualize faking illness reveals perhaps more clearly than anything else the fakeries of psychiatry. Consider in this connection a congressional committee's estimate that one of 50 practicing physicians in the United States today is an imposter. Surely this suggests that physicians are not particularly adept at distinguishing real doctors from fake ones, a fact that does not inspire confidence in their ability to distinguish real patients from fake ones. Moreover, even if physicians identify a person as faking illness, psychiatrists, as we saw, immediately diagnose him as suffering from a factitious illness. But if the person who pretends to be ill is considered to be a bona fide patient having a factitious illness, why is the person who pretends to be a doctor not considered to be a bona fide physician offering factitious therapy? How are these conflicting claims resolved? The way all such conflicting claims in psychiatry, and of course, not in psychiatry alone, are resolved by the stronger party imposing his will on the weaker one. The result, in the first instance, is that the subject's claim to insanity is disconfirmed and he is officially declared to be sane, while in the second instance, the subject's claim to sanity is disconfirmed and he is officially declared to be insane. I shall illustrate both of these scenarios.
simulating insanity. In the aftermath of the war in Vietnam, many ex-servicemen reported difficulties in personal adjustment, which they attributed to the stress of military action endured in that unpopular war. Psychiatrists recognize this as a type of mental illness and call it post-traumatic stress disorder, abbreviated as PTSD. If this condition is defined as being due to the stress of military service, it would seem that if a person who had never been in Vietnam claimed to be suffering from PTSD due to service in Vietnam, his claim would not constitute an illness. But it does. Psychiatrists regard factitious PTSD also as an illness that can and must be diagnosed, has an etiology, and requires appropriate treatment. Edward Lynn and Mark Belza, two psychiatrists at the VA Medical Center in Reno, Nevada, have published a report on seven cases of factitious PTSD found among veterans who were never in combat and in some cases were never in Vietnam. In the author's experience, this is not a rare ailment. During a five-month period in a 20-bed psychiatric unit with an average daily census of only 14, the authors observed seven such cases. After discussing the etiologies of the disorder and the underlying psychopathology and recommendations for diagnosis and treatment, the authors conclude, clearly then, our first responsibility is to develop an awareness of factitious PTSD, for until we do, patients with such disorders will not receive appropriate care. To conclude that persons who lie about having been made mentally ill in Vietnam are liars is evidently not among the responsibilities of contemporary American psychiatrists. The eagerness with which psychiatrists and even district attorneys and judges accept fabricated stories of stress in Vietnam as genuine mental diseases is illustrated by the case of a man named Samuel Lockett. Accused of several robberies in Brooklyn in 1983, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming that he was suffering from Vietnam Stress Syndrome. His claim was accepted not only by numerous psychiatrists, but also by Brooklyn District Attorney Elizabeth Holtzman and New York State Supreme Court Justice Michael Juvillier. It was later discovered that Lockett was never in Vietnam. Dissimulating Insanity Dissimulating insanity, also known as simulating sanity, is the mirror image of the situation we have just considered. The subject wants to appear sane, but others discredit him as insane. The stories of some sensational crimes in recent American history give us a ringside seat from which to watch this spectacle. The first such story I shall present is that of one of the most celebrated crazy murderers of recent years, namely the story of David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam. I offer this case because although Berkowitz seemed patently totally insane after he was apprehended, his supposedly severe mental illness completely escaped detection during the many years preceding his capture. The son of Sam, as may be recalled, was a young man named David Berkowitz who terrorized New York City in 1976 and 1977 by killing six people and wounding seven others. At the time of his trial, Berkowitz justified the killings by claiming that he was carrying out the orders of demons and a dog. Barely 18 months later, Berkowitz insisted that his crazy behavior had been a sham. Quite frankly, he told an Associated Press reporter who visited him in the Attica, New York prison, this is fictitious, it is invented, it is a lie. There were no real demons, no talking dogs, no satanic henchmen. I made it all up. Confronted with Berkowitz's claim that he had faked insanity, Daniel Schwartz, who headed the team of psychiatrists who had examined Berkowitz and testified that he was psychotic, said, if it, the story of demonic possession, was an act, it was an all-time winner. Schwartz explained that he believed Berkowitz's story because it was so convincing and had so much peripheral validation. That, of course, is nonsense. He accepted Berkowitz's wild story because by authenticating Berkowitz as a crazy psychotic, Schwartz in effect legitimized himself as a caring psychiatrist. In August 1980, in an interview with the Buffalo Evening News, Berkowitz reiterated his claim that he is not now and never was mentally ill. Noticeably thinner than in 1977, he insists he was not mentally ill when he was in the army, not when he was firing a gun at nameless faces in New York's dark lover's lanes, not when he was being examined by psychiatrists, and not when he was screaming out in the courtroom.
Some of the things Berkowitz told the Buffalo Evening News reporter are worth repeating here. The tapes, Berkowitz explained, are authentic in that I said those things, demons impelling him to kill, etc., but they are not authentic because I was feigning and malingering. Berkowitz maintained that he was faking insanity to allay his guilt for the killings. Perhaps, and perhaps he was doing it also for the dramatic attention his claims attracted. In any case, Berkowitz has petitioned the courts for a hearing to declare him competent to manage his affairs. He had been declared incompetent and assigned a conservator. Indeed, the evening news reporter who spoke at length with Berkowitz found him to be quite sane. If clear, articulate responses and conversation coupled with normal amounts of smiling and laughter and the appreciation of nuances of good and evil concepts are signs of competency, then David Berkowitz is all there. Francis Mills, chief of psychiatric services at the Attica Correctional Facility, who sees Berkowitz almost daily, agrees, I have never found him psychotic. Another Attica official described Berkowitz as crazy as a fox. None of this matters. After concluding that Berkowitz acted like a sane man and talked like a sane man, the evening news reporter ends with the characteristic caveat of our psychiatric age. Yet, what is one to think of someone who for no visible reason shot at 15 people he didn't know, killing six of them, injuring seven, and missing two? One thinks, of course, that such a person was insane, is presently insane, and will always be insane. My second example, the story of the Reverend Jim Jones, the minister who presided over the once-famed People's Paradise in Guyana, and then went on to murder every member of the group he could lay his hands on, is more complicated. Although this story offers the same cautionary tale concerning the question, who is really insane, as does Berkowitz's, the Jones story is more complex, and perhaps also more instructive, because, despite his remarkable utterances and behavior, Jones was never diagnosed as mentally ill while he was alive. The diagnosis that he was psychotic was made only posthumously. Of course, it was not based, as one might expect in the case of a brain disease, on what pathologists discovered in his brain. Instead, it was based entirely on what his followers, friends, and political supporters discovered to be in their own best interest. The story, briefly, is this. Jim Jones, the founder of Jonestown, had been a duly consecrated priest of a respected Christian denomination and the object of praise and admiration by the high and mighty in American politics and public life. He was also the cold-blooded murderer of 900 men, women, and children. James Warren Jones was born on May 13, 1931, in a small town in Indiana. As a child, he liked to play minister, his first flock being animals. According to Kenneth Wooden's story of Jonestown, as a boy, Jones frequently took in animals, cared for them, won their trust, then killed them and gave them elaborate funerals with candles and all the accoutrements. In 1964, Jones was ordained a minister in the Protestant denomination called Disciples of Christ. The following year, he and his followers moved to California. In San Francisco, Jones advertised himself with flyers that read, in part, as follows. Pastor Jim Jones, prophet, saves lives of total strangers with his predictions. Scores will be present to give medical documentation of the amazing healing, healer of cancerous diseases doctors called incurable. Special notice, this message of God proclaims apostolic social justice of equality and proves his message by divine signs and wonders. With the proven formula of claiming to help the helpless, especially blacks, children, the aged, and the poor, Jones quickly amassed a fortune by funneling their social security benefits to himself. At the same time, with the aid of the media, he succeeded in creating an image of himself as a humanitarian, a healer, and a defender of civil rights. Consider just a few of the accolades heaped upon him. In April 1975, Religion in American Life, a national interfaith organization, named him one of the 100 most outstanding clergymen in the nation. In the same year, the San Francisco newspaper, Sun Reporter, owned by Carlton Goodlett, a black physician who became Jones's personal doctor, presented him with a Citizen's Merit Award for his dedication to social justice. A year later, the Los Angeles Herald bestowed upon him its Humanitarian of the Year Award. In September 1976, Jones supported Jimmy Carter's candidacy for president, 
and dined in private with Mrs. Rosalind Carter in San Francisco. Subsequently, Mrs. Carter heaped praise on Jones. Among those who endorsed Jones during his early years in California were Hubert Humphrey, Jane Fonda, Walter Mondale, and many others. Was this the same man who on November 18, 1978, murdered 900 men, women, and children? Of course not. It couldn't have been. So the story had to be quickly rewritten. As soon as the news of the massacre hit the wires, it was taken for granted by psychiatrists, politicians, the press, the public, that Jones was and had for some time been crazy, insane, psychotic. Political columnist Patrick J. Buchanan's rhetorical query was typical. Why wasn't the Secret Service alerted to keep Mrs. Carter miles away from a certifiable madman like the Rev's Jim Jones? Mrs. Carter had met Jones two years earlier. Distinguished American psychiatrists quickly volunteered to suggest that the murdered, as well as the murderer, were really good people to whom something terrible had happened. Opined Thomas Ungerleiter, a professor of psychiatry at the University of California at Los Angeles, I believe it was the jungle. The members got no feedback from the outside world. They did not read Time magazine or watch the news at night. Alvin Poussent, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard and one of the leading black psychiatrists in America, offered this interpretation. We cannot in good conscience fault the mission of the rank and file because of the acute psychosis of their leader. The humanitarian experiment itself was not a failure. The Reverend Jones was, emphasis added. Leading commentators in the press agreed, but framed their diagnoses in simpler terms. The Reverend Jones, concluded James Reston of the New York Times, was an obviously demented man. But it was not so obvious when Jones was alive. One of Jones's lawyers, Mark Lane, an attorney of considerable notoriety and an expert on conspiracies and madness in high places, served as Jones's trusted counselor right up to the very moment of the mass murder. Lane must thus have considered his client to be sane, at least sane enough to be his client. However, as soon as Lane got away from Guyana, he described Jones as a paranoid murderer. Charles Gary, Jones's other legal advisor, also liked the insanity theory. Before the massacre, he heaped praise on Jones and his commune. The camp, he asserted, was a beautiful jewel. There is no racism, no sexism, no ageism, no elitism, no hunger. After the massacre, he was equally well informed. I am convinced, he declared, that this guy was stark, raving mad. I shall try to show that the description of Jones's concentration camp as a beautiful jewel and of Jones as a madman are equally untrue. Moreover, even after the massacre, Carlton Goodlett, the influential black physician newspaper owner, insisted that Jones was involved in a brilliant experiment in Guyana, slash and added, the deserters from the church had come to me but they were just a neurotic fringe. After the story in New West magazine appeared in 1977, this was the expose that led to Jones's flight from San Francisco to Guyana, and ultimately to the end of his experiment. Goodlett complained that the reporters got their information from malcontents, psychoneurotics, and, in some instances, provocateurs, probably establishment agents. Clearly, Jones was someone to reckon with. Kenneth Wooden documents the veritable torrent of complaints lodged against Jones, especially during the last three years of his reign, all of which, because of Jones's political connections, were either ignored or killed. He writes, Many of the survivors of the People's Temple were bitter toward the President and Mrs. Carter as well. After Jim Jones' highly publicized meeting with Mrs. Carter and his public endorsement of her husband, a number of ex-members wrote the First Lady. Mickey Touchette, a survivor, remembered. We told her what he was doing and what was involved and what kind of a man he was, and she turned a deaf ear to us. Mrs. Carter, it should be recalled, was honorary chairperson of the President's Commission on Mental Health and ranked mental health as her foremost concern. She embraced Jim Jones as a fellow soldier in the war on mental illness and helped to consolidate Jones's image as a great healer successful in rehabilitating drug abusers. The facts are embarrassing, indeed. Numerous authorities colluded with Jones in his criminal activities and stand convicted by the evidence, such as the large quantity of arms and ammunition that had been sent to Guyana from the United States, all illegally. Finally, perhaps the supreme irony of this story 
lies in a pair of contradictions I have not yet even mentioned. Jones, the man who goes down in history as one of the greatest mass poisoners the world has ever seen, was hailed, while alive, as a heroic fighter in the struggle against what we mendaciously call drug abuse, that is, the self-administration of drugs, especially illegal drugs. In addition, Jones, the man who practiced mass homicide, preached and protested against suicide, that is, self-determined death. On Memorial Day in 1977, only 18 months before he murdered his followers, Jones led a delegation of People's Temple members on a march onto the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, demanding that the city build a suicide barrier there. Was Jones the supremely sane humanitarian, seeking to lift up the oppressed as everyone who mattered saw him before the Jonestown Massacre? Or was he an insane tyrant, seeking to imprison and murder his victims, which is how everyone who matters has seen him ever since? I think both questions are foolish. Consider only a few of the reports about Jones's behavior during the period when he was generally regarded not merely as normal, but as morally superior. Jones insisted that he and he alone be addressed as father. He was married, kept several mistresses, and had sex with numerous women and men in the commune. Everyone in the commune had to confess publicly that he or she was a homosexual. Several times before the final butchery, he conducted rehearsals of the communal carnage. He claimed that he was Jesus, could cure cancer, and ordered pages torn from Bibles to be used as toilet paper. I conclude that Jones wanted to appear as if he were a savior like Jesus, that his followers wanted him to appear in that light, and that that was the foundation on which Jonestown was built. Why was Jones never diagnosed as mentally ill, insane, or psychotic during his lifetime? If Jones was psychotic when he ordered Congressman Leo Ryan's murder and the mass murder-suicide of his followers, why didn't anyone in the Ryan party or any of the visiting journalists observe any sign of mental illness in Jones? The answer, I submit, is briefly this. Jones never presented himself as crazy or in need of psychiatric help, and neither did anyone else ever present him in that way. On the contrary, he defined himself as a devout religious leader, a compassionate Christian whose only goal in life was to help the poor, the sick, and the downtrodden. He also claimed to be a devoted family man, and numerous courts authenticated him as a father, not only to his own children, but to many orphans as well. In short, Jones had never cast himself in the role of a person with mental problems. No one had ever impugned his sanity, and most importantly, his own physician, lawyers, fellow churchmen, prominent politicians, and the press all legitimized him as a completely normal, mentally healthy person. This, I believe, is why he always appeared sane to everyone who met him. Because of its sheer simplicity, this answer may strike most people as unsatisfactory or wrong, but the evidence strongly supports it. Appearance or Reality Berkowitz's serial claims, first of insanity, then of sanity, raise the question always asked in such cases, namely, was he pretending to be insane or was he really insane? The form of this question implies that feigning insanity and being insane are two distinct and separate conditions. I believe that is not so. It only seems so because we give a literal interpretation to the metaphoric illness we call insanity, imitating real illness and imitating fake illness. Feigning bleeding from a peptic ulcer and bleeding from a peptic ulcer are two different conditions. The former consists of an act, namely, the impersonation of a person who bleeds from a peptic ulcer, whereas the latter consists of a display of an objectively verifiable bodily condition, namely, bleeding from an ulceration of the stomach or duodenum. By contrast, feigning insanity and being insane are not two different conditions, but are one and the same thing. Both consist of the insane acts of a person or moral agent. As I have tried to show in earlier chapters, mental illness is an action, not a lesion. As Shakespeare showed, and I agree with him, it is also an act in the sense of a theatrical impersonation. But if being psychotic is like playing Hamlet, then feigning being psychotic is like feigning playing Hamlet, which would be the same as playing Hamlet. The point is that Hamlet is nothing but a role. No one is or can be Hamlet. An actor who plays Hamlet and an actor who impersonates an actor who plays Hamlet, there is a potentially infinite regress here, are both playing Hamlet. 
Similarly, a person who is psychotic and another who merely pretends to be psychotic are both acting crazy, both will appear to be crazy, and both will be diagnosed by psychiatrists as crazy. Of course, there are many different reasons why people act crazy, just as there are many different reasons why actors are actors. But these reasons or motives do not affect the phenomenon we see and observe, which is an act that we call insanity or psychosis. In short, the question whether Berkowitz was psychotic or was only pretending to be psychotic poses a pseudo-problem. The fact is that Berkowitz was deceitful and dishonest. This was clear in the theatrical dramatization of his madness, specifically in his claim that he was not David Berkowitz but the son of Sam. He might as well have listed himself on the playbill as Jack the Ripper. It was perfectly obvious who he really was. Whether Berkowitz was trying to deceive us, himself, or both, we cannot readily determine and may even be unknowable. In any case, it has no bearing on the view I am proposing, nor has the intentionality or conscious awareness with which Berkowitz was pretending have any bearing on it, see chapter 7. I allude here to some of my critics' attempts to rebut my argument by asserting that persons who commit such crimes are not fully conscious of their actions, in short, that such imitations are unconscious. But that, too, is beside the point. Imitation is imitation, regardless of the actor's awareness of his behavior, his reasons for it, or his intention for performing it. It is worth noting here, at least in passing, that the imitation of mental states is of interest not only to psychiatrists and other interpreters of our secular, criminal, and mental health laws, but also to theologians and other interpreters of the Roman Catholic canon law. For example, Canon 1101, titled Simulation of Matrimonial Consent, is devoted entirely to an analysis of the problem of simulation as it relates to the internal consent of the mind, of the party contracting to marry. Unlike psychiatrists, priests interpret the simulation of consent not as a manifestation of factitious consent, but as a manifestation of the simulator's true intent to withhold consent. In addition, the priests also emphasize that simulation is not the sort of thing one can observe. Since simulation involves an internal act, its external proof is difficult. Basically, simulation involves a person's taking a definite stand contrary to the church's view of marriage. Mental illness as deception and counter-deception. Suppose we grant, for the sake of advancing the argument, that behavior such as Berkowitz displayed by pretending to be the son of Sam is a type of deception. What have we proved? Obviously, deception is not the same as what we call a psychosis. Actors, politicians, people in all walks of life also engage in deceptions, so deception is not enough for generating a diagnosis of psychosis. In addition, a certain kind of response from psychiatrists, lawyers, and judges is also required. Specifically, what is required is a counter-deception, couched in the language of psychiatry, that fits, like a hand in a glove, the subject's deception. The subject viewed as a patient asserts that he is not bad because his act was compelled by God or demons. The psychiatrist viewed as a medical scientist asserts that the patient is indeed not bad because his act was caused by his psychosis. The crux of such a diagnosis thus lies in the smoothly meshing combination of a reciprocal deception and counter-deception and its official medical, legal, and social acceptance and accreditation as disease and diagnosis. The case of the son of Sam illustrates beautifully this meshing pattern of deception and counter-deception and its legitimation as psychosis and psychiatric diagnosis. Berkowitz's behavior consisting of an obviously staged caricature of the behavior of a crazed maniac was officially accepted as a psychosis, and the psychiatrist's behavior consisting of a similarly staged caricature of a doctor examining a patient was officially accepted as a diagnostic determination. What is invariably overlooked in situations of this sort is that every person observing or participating, whether as actor or audience, in a situation of this sort has a choice. He is free to accept the stereotyped psychiatric story now conventionally regarded as the correct explanation or to reject it and formulate his own explanation. The following interpretation seems to me particularly plausible. When adults view a child playing fireman, they interpret his behavior as playing fireman. Similarly, an observer of the Berkowitz trial, especially a newspaper reporter, 
could in principle have interpreted Berkowitz's behavior as that of a person impersonating, playing the role of, a madman claiming to be controlled by demons, and he could have interpreted the forensic psychiatrist's behavior as that of a person impersonating, playing the role of, a doctor diagnosing a dangerous and mysterious disease. The point is that virtually no one today chooses such an interpretation, not the defendant, not the defense attorney, not the psychiatrist testifying for the defense, not the prosecuting attorney, not the psychiatrist testifying for the prosecution, not the judge, not the reporters, not anyone. Obviously, I am suggesting just such an interpretation, namely that Berkowitz chose to kill and chose to act crazy, and that the authorities chose to define him as psychotic. Now, Berkowitz says he is no longer interested in killing people, and some of the psychiatrists say they are no longer interested in defining him as psychotic. But if Berkowitz was so sick, how did he get cured? I raise this question here only to show how the mendacity that psychosis is a disease is matched by the mendacity that it can be cured. Like anyone else, a psychotic person can, of course, change his behavior. But abandoning a career of killing people is not a cure, just as embracing such a career is not a disease. What can we learn from a story such as that of David Berkowitz? We can learn that although it is impossible to fake having a mental illness, it is possible, indeed it is quite easy, to assume the role of mental patient by acting crazy. Since a person who acts crazy is usually regarded as crazy or having a mental illness, it is, ipso facto, impossible to distinguish a person who is crazy from one who only pretends to be crazy. To repeat, Hamlet is the name of a fictitious person and of a role. When the play Hamlet is performed, an actor plays Hamlet. An actor imitating an actor playing Hamlet would still be playing Hamlet. Thus, it is sensible to say that a person plays the role of Hamlet or the role of a mental patient, well or poorly, convincingly or unconvincingly, but it is stupid, indeed nonsensical, to say that a person imitates the role of Hamlet or the role of a mental patient. I have called attention earlier to the corresponding phenomenon in relation to bodily illness, namely, that just as a lesion is always real, regardless of whether it is inflicted on the patient's body by another person, the patient himself, or some other impersonal agency, so a role is always real, regardless of whether others approve or disapprove of the actor's motives for assuming it. In short, a person can perform a role well or poorly, successfully or unsuccessfully, with or without the approval of certain authorities. In any case, the role he plays is his role. C.S. Lewis anticipated what I am trying to say here when he warned that all mortals turn into the things they are pretending to be. 